The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon and welcome to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Mike McAuliffe. With me, as always, in the studio is my co-host, Perry Heitschew. Thank you for having today? me. Thank you for having uh, well, me. I'm doing you're, very you're well. part of this team, Perry. Uh, we, we have, uh, uh, as always, we've got a bunch of news. Uh, we'll start off actually with, um, with just something which is late breaking uh, here in Nevada today, and it's not a, a major piece unless you're trying to get your paperwork done. Um, KSNV TV reported that the Nevada State Medical Marijuana Program uh, is, has been taken offline uh, by their IT department. That doesn't mean that the, the program itself is uh, is offline or not running or, or it's not working. It's uh, just anyway. back to paper. <laughs> but yeah, their, their website. Um, uh, their uh, deputy administrator, Joe Pollock, said the site was taken o o offline uh, after their IT department pointed out security issues. He said there's been no evidence to suggest a security breach has occurred uh, and that the website is being evaluated by the state uh, division of health IT department. Department, uh, but he doesn't know when it's going to be back up. So if you're uh, uh, just happen to be going on there looking uh, for your renewal or looking for a new application, uh, uh, the state is experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. Yeah, I uh, recently got my. It's not a packet anymore. It was just a letter with a piece of paper saying you can do this online and this is how you go through it and this then and then of course you know this went down but it's okay you know i'm not due till february or something they're just giving me my two-month notice but uh, i'm not sure whether this has any effect on their ability uh to see what you're purchasing at the dispensaries or not because when i was up purchasing cannabis from mm -hmm. or purchasing my medicine from a local dispensary the other day they seemed to not be so sure about what i was able to buy and just said well the hell with it you know what I mean? And yeah, just let I me go do Saturday, my thing. The, the people were saying the site was down and they couldn't they couldn't track uh, yeah. how much was being done. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Like, did you know? Did they have to take the entire, the whole system down just because of this? And if so, one would you think know. that they're actually two separate uh, uh, programs and, and two separate domains running. That's one what I thought. Being the the public uh, portal for uh, people coming into Div Health and getting involved in the program, but one would think that the the actual. Um, uh, software that communicates between the dispensaries and the state to show these patient counts and amounts bought uh, and, and the like, you would think that they that would be a completely different system. But uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Uh, very likely it's going to come back uh, up just in the next day or two, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll keep an eye on this. And if it's still down uh, as we approach airtime next week, we'll take a closer look into it. Uh, one thing I would say on this, because uh, you mentioned paper, is that um, Back in 2001, when the program started, uh, not only did they have the um, uh, all the forms that you have, but the main form that you had to fill out was uh, was in uh, quintuplicate. Uh, you know, there were five copies that had to go to five different agencies uh, within the state government and this and that. And ultimately, um, in 2004, the Department of Agriculture, who was running the program at that time, uh, indicated that they needed to start charging patients for the packs because they said that it cost them about $50 to mail out each, uh, each application pack to a patient. And so they used that to, um, to justify to the legislature the $50 uh, initial application fee hmm. that, they, that they charged so for a decade. So that's where that comes from. Uh, that's where that came from because originally the program uh, was completely free. You could write in and the state would send you the paperwork and that was that. But what really... Um, you know, as we, as people who listen to this show know, I'm I'm on the progressive side, and and so I think that uh, uh, in some times, uh, you know, government running efficiently can provide an answer. But uh, what I saw here was that um, you had these packs going out in the state saying, "Oh my God, it's fifty dollars a piece." 
And, and I was looking at the packs, having received them and distributed them to patients and saying, gee, if I could only get a concession to mail these things out for $10 a piece or $5 a piece, there is no way that that pack should cost the state $50 to mail out and therefore pass it on to the patients. And, you know, that's one of those instances where I say, boy, a little privatization might actually be a good thing. Oh, sure. There. Well, um, something that was just kind of running through my head, we were talking about burden of patients and fees and things like that. Do mm -hmm. you think that the passage of question four might have any, any bearing on the taxation of medical marijuana considering it was a big anti you know taking taxes when, when away from medicinal equipment talking about question like four here in Nevada you're talking about the the uh, the initiative that uh, was taking medical devices uh, out of the sales is, tax is that was it all it was just devices it didn't well I guess normal medicine already isn't taxed so there would be no reason to put that language right. in that bill right if you, it would if just you're be buying us. prescription medicine for example uh, it is not taxed uh, and so so you if know. you have your medical marijuana card you shouldn't have to pay sales taxes on your grow equipment <laughs> uh, wow, that's an interesting way to look at it. I know um, it's kind of a stretch, you know. but it's just a thought. And and one would think that if, if it is indeed medicine, uh, as the state of Nevada says that it is, uh, that you should not have to be paying tax on that. But in order to get these businesses off the ground and the state to uh, approve that, uh, there were several levels of tax built in before, sure, of course. before the consumer even sees it uh, in the form of um, uh excise taxes and so uh, and you see across the country that they're taxing these people very very heavily so on the one hand the the state governments are saying oh yeah we understand yeah marijuana is medicine and it's your medicine and you need your medicine uh, that's fine but we're not going to treat it like medicine because we're still going to charge a tax on it right you know and it, it just it, it just shows how uh, haphazard the implementation of these laws are and the, the, the thinking behind them is but um, anyway the the state of Nevada medical marijuana program website is down at the moment uh, but it will be back shortly uh, they're getting millions of dollars in fees so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sure be they fine. have the money to, to do that um, staying here in Nevada we we have a, a story also out of um, uh, the Las Vegas Review Journal by uh, author uh, reporter Sean Whaley and this was on the 11th and it says says that um, implementing recreational pot rules won't tax Nevada's budget, officials say. And uh, it leads off saying that neither state regulators nor law lawmaker, who would be Tick Sigerblom, uh, who pushed through Nevada's medical marijuana program, expect funding to be an issue as the state moves into the realm of pot sales. Nevada has money in its medical marijuana program that could be used for any upfront costs for recreational marijuana, such as licensing inspections of new dispensaries and the like. So here you've got something where the, um, the state is 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 using the money they have in the medical marijuana program now as a slush fund to start the recreational side. And well, I'm okay. Well, it's happening in. in I'm okay with health, that. So. It allows them to not dip into the general fund and have it be seen as a cost. So if they can just kind of rob Peter to pay Paul, I suppose, as long as the money is reimbursed into or the medical marijuana program. Peter because, yeah, because in this case yeah. they they are going to get that money back. That's fine. You know, th there's no doubt that the revenue will be there soon enough to pay it back. So as long as that's that that uh, that's fulfilled, I mean, yeah. no, I, don't, I don't see any problem with it. Uh, I I don't either. Especially, it's just that um, uh, you you had all of this money coming into the uh, the. Division of Health over the past uh, couple of years, as these um, uh, as these different MME uh, applicants fees were come in, putting yeah. the fees up, putting the uh, you know their first annual licensing and, and all that, and so the division was making uh, several million dollars out of this. So um, a lot of people wondered why that amount of money was really necessary, and and still can, but at least they're using some of it to jumpstart the uh, the rec side, and mm -hmm. uh, that that will be a good thing. Um, Seems like they're getting their ducks in a row like you said they want to push this through early in the legislative session to get these medical shops mm -hmm. rolled over into recreational and this is the first thing is getting that money lined up to allow the uh, the division to do what they need to do well I know that uh, that Tick Sergerblom is planning on uh, introducing this uh, legislation in the first couple of days oh, yeah, they'll try. of the session. They're going to try to get it in there. In there. However, um, what some of my other sources uh, from Carson City are telling me is that uh, 
the entire legislature is not going to be in a hurry to pass this thing. And the optimistic view that the dispensary owners are, are hoping for is that this legislation will be crafted and passed by April to allow, uh, to allow adults to, to get out there and start uh, patronizing these, these facilities. Um, but in fact, uh, if you look at uh, marijuana measures in the Nevada State Legislature over the past decade plus, um, these measures are generally the last things get passed uh, just before the session uh, um, closes. Nevada is a very different state than it was four years, four years ago. Um, so we, we yeah. will see in terms of you know politics and demographics and you know a lot has changed. We've gone from red to purple to a definitive blue yeah, rather yeah. rather quickly here. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and know, actually as people it, say, it, oh, it you know, traditionally this and that, it's like honestly, there have been a lot of very non-traditional things going about you know going on in Nevada over the last couple of years mm -hmm. you know our Republican governor passing the biggest tax increase in Nevada history paid parking in Las Vegas all over the place I could point to dozens and dozens of individual little things that can say well Nevada's going in a strange direction there, there's nothing traditional going on about what we're trying to do here in the state in the last few years so hmm. you know we'll see where this all heads and as somebody who's grown up here, you have a you oh, have absolutely. A oh, yeah. of these things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Most people. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about all of it yet. We'll see how it comes out. One thing that I found interesting in this RJ article is a paragraph <clears throat> where it said, Seegerblum said that there are enough gray areas with the question two wording that additional legislation may be needed in the 2017 session, which begins February 6th. So that I find fascinating because the uh, the way our const our state constitution works is that if we have a voter initiative, the legislature is not supposed to tweak it or otherwise screw with it for at least three years. Mm -hmm. the, the, the word of the people, the mandate of the people is supposed to be enacted and that's that and don't start futzing around with it uh, because that's not what the people voted for. However, with what he's saying that there are enough gray areas in question two that additional legislation may be needed, um, that opens up a huge can of worms. If you're going to say, well, we're just going to, you know, open up the hood and we're just going to take a screwdriver and adjust there a little bit and we're going to take a wrench and adjust here a little bit uh, pretty soon I kind of like that because uh, I, I question two needs major major surgery so I'm all I'm all for it if they want to cut it right open they want to do open heart surgery on it right away day one I want I'm, I want to be in there you know watching and, and sure. I, I don't disagree with that, but the reason that I point this out is because there will be people uh, in the legislature, I'm sure, who will say to us or to people who are moving for reform or want to carry this a little further, well, they'll say, we can't do that because the voter mandate was this and it doesn't uh, well, you know, give us the ability to go one inch over the line There's that, something to be said really about does. that. Well, there's something to be said about that. It's a dangerous precedent we're attempting to set. We're trying mm -hmm. to open this and it'll open the door potentially for other people down the line to adjust voter initiatives that we may not be in support mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very similar to like Harry Reid introduced the nuclear option to the Nevada, to the uh, to, to the, the Senate, Senate yeah. and now the Republicans are prepared to do the exact same thing. You know, he was warned about this, and it's going to burn him, and that will be one of his legacies. I'm I'm, I'm sad to say, I think that next was next thing sooner or later with some. But it happened. But it happened with it him. him. But it was him. And I think it's going to be the same kind of thing here if we do this and we pull it off. Mm -hmm. You better be prepared for what comes down the road five, six, ten years down the line when we have things that aren't you know we're not happy about that that this happens to you so we need to be prepared for on both sides of that that's true but to say if we pull it off this or that indicates that we actually have a hand in this from what i re see in this article um it's going to happen it's not whether we're pushing that or not or whether oh, we're it's whether well it's in my opinion uh the validity of this will be a weight upon whether me being we we can and the the forces of good in my mm -hmm. opinion try to insert certain language once they're able to open that hood that will protect people and and uh, make necessary changes that we believe are better for ourselves and our communities and that a lot of people feel are better for the community and if we're not able to do that then I'll call it a failure and it's very right. selfish of me to call it that way but it just is what it is well I, I think that um, I, I agree with you what you're saying and, and my point here is that if they are going to change it then it is up to us as the citizenry to say, well, if you're going to do that, we want you to 
twist it this way. We want oh, you yeah. to turn the screwdriver. Yeah, if you're going to open it up, way. we want we want our say too. What exactly the hell? that. And and there is a lot of uh, uh, improvement. There's a lot of room for improvement in question two. Uh, and uh, as uh, Senator Segerblom said, there there are some gray areas. And so if there are gray areas that are going to get addressed, my thought as being an activist in the community, and I, I would hope that our our listenership, our viewership would would agree with this, is that if change are going to be made we want to be able to have input on that now I, I like tick a lot and and so I, I don't uh, think that he's going to do things which will be bad for us but at the same time I think that it's up to us who are very much involved and interested in these sort of things to be out there lobbying for the changes that that we want and you know because you've lobbied up at the I don't think a lot of the changes that people want are gonna make a big difference in the bottom line of these recreational dispensaries the right for patients to grow regardless of the 25 mile rule mm -hmm. or not patients just citizens at this point regular citizens who fall under the who fall under question two's protection uh, we want them to be able to grow this is separate from from the patients who also should have the right to grow definitely mm -hmm. they should be mm -hmm. able to grow their necessary amount that's uh, that's you know mandated to them under the Constitution of the state of Nevada um, I don't really see that crushing these people's business uh, if it was me and I could change it I would want to have an unlimited number of dispense like if you fall within zoning mm -hmm. and the city or that municipality will allow that many licenses to come in I don't see the state having should have the I don't think the state should have the ability to stop said municipalities from taking as many as they so choose and if those if they want to roll them back and change the zoning they can choose to do that at a later date and we should let the free market decide but that's a big major 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 change that a lot of the pre-existing dispensary owners who donated to question two will have a big problem with yeah so you know i don't think that's going to happen but i think we could get uh i think we could get lounges in like we were talking before the mm -hmm. show real quick mm -hmm. i mean there's a lot i mean we, we could go back and forth all day long just about what we would do about this one and this i think one story. that is one of these gray areas that that tick was talking about is is lounges mm -hmm. uh, on, on site, site consumption. consumption and uh i do think that that will work its way into the legislation but once again it, where it's up to to us in the community uh to to is not just to cheer on oh we're going to have lounges and we can go have hash bars like coffee shops in amsterdam but no we want to be able to say to the legislature this is a good idea however make the barrier to entry much lower than you made the first time around mm -hmm. with the the mmes because that way you give uh the disappearing middle class entrepreneurs in the, in Nevada the opportunity to go in there and take part in this revolution and also uh, to come into it from a different perspective than some of the the teams that have uh, have assembled uh, there are license holders in the state of Nevada who are exceptionally qualified uh, and have a great uh, and diverse portfolio of experience and and knowledge that they bring to this industry but as we have seen there are also um, Elmer Fudds out there who who are completely clueless borderline prohibitionists with a big with a deep uh, deep pockets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and some of these people have these licenses and now they are going to fiercely protect those licenses just as happened in Arizona a couple of years back uh, when the dispensary owners uh, were fighting the initiative to legalize in Arizona uh, prior to the, this mm -hmm. cycle uh, and they said well we need to recoup our investment we need to protect our profits and and that's it in, in, in a nutshell well, they wanted it they wanted to control and monopolize that market that, that is, you can call it evil you can call it capitalism you can call it lobbying whatever it is it is what it is it's mm -hmm. been done here in Nevada for a long period of time back in the day when uh, when casino when the gaming control board wasn't around you could basically throw up four walls in a roof and put anything you wanted under it and then all of a sudden after these people started making some money and getting organized they said hey maybe we want to write some rules mm -hmm. that's where the 250 room rule came so you couldn't have a full casino floor without 250 rooms and you had to be within zone da, 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 da. obviously they were trying to squeeze everybody out because a lot of the operators already had a lot of what they thought was the good land already wrapped up and they just wanted to kind of push the people that they didn't know already as far away as they could and that's why a lot of these controlling families here still maintain a lot 
Mm -hmm. it's just it, it, it's just one of those stories you know what i mean so i'm not surprised that uh that the pre-existing dispensary owners would go after that in fact i was pushing to have only nevada residents to be able to own dispensaries at the first just to try to lock people out to give us a better chance and that's to get in on the ground floor back in 2009 well, and that's what alaska and worked for them. and that's what alaska has done also and it's driving me nuts because i wanted to get up there and invest mm -hmm. and they shut me out so it's just one of those things it is what it is mm -hmm. so here we are <laughs> crazy so anyway uh, according to this article it says that there are 49 medical marijuana dispensaries open in nevada wow. so here we are a couple of years after uh after uh uh, SB 374 got passed and they were allowing 66 in the state and here we are we're allowed 66 but we only have 40 so there, that's 26 dispensary licenses that have not uh, been taken advantage and I didn't can, think we had 50 open yet to tell you the truth I didn't realize it had been so many that's yeah that's impressive yep um, but still like you said w what about these 26 so uh, that that allows 49 open that that allows uh, 17 that have not opened and you can say that 12 of the 17 count counties are, are not allowing uh, medical marijuana facilities within their county borders. So that, that would count for 12 of them. But that still means that uh, in, this, uh, in this emerging uh, marijuana industry in Nevada, that you, you still had uh, seven licenses granted that have not opened in the state. And uh, as I recall um, uh, Commissioner uh, Sisolak saying, uh, early in the year that if people were not substantially uh, done with their planning, begun their build outs, had their SUPs uh, pulled and all that sort of stuff, that those licenses were going to get denied. But if they were, in theory, we should have had uh, one of those 10 day windows open that we had a couple of years ago yeah, nothing where, like where, that they, put the, where, where they, they put out a, a call for applications, but they never did. So there, there's some kinky stuff going on here and and nobody everybody says oh give us time to work it out we're just starting this out oh, and sure everyone but, was slow dragging you know. it until question two passed no one wanted to put big money in after they saw a lot of these larger operations yep you know losing a lot of money just due to medical the demand wasn't there so i mean if it was me and i was doing that i'd try to slow drag it too and that's mm -hmm. why you see so many places trying to pop open now well so we're, we're going to see where this goes but this is something where uh, uh we at we can uh, are going to stay involved with uh through the next level legislative session but we also need you guys out there in the community to uh, to reach out and, and support uh, us and support uh, sensible marijuana reform in the Nevada legislature so with that we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back from the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth wood interior and beautiful artwork as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind body and spirit that balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Let's uh, yeah, jump right back into it. Back into it. You know, one of the things that has been consuming us here uh, since Election Day uh, is the um, uh, the surprise uh, that was Donald Trump's election uh, as, as President of the United States. Um, 
can't believe I'm saying that. Um, but anyway, there have been a lot of stories coming out, when, and uh, in the in the shows that immediately follow the election, uh, we talked about some of our concerns, uh, some of the people who might go into this administration. And now that uh, we see more of these names being named. Uh, it only gets worse and worse. I mean, we started off with, um, uh, well, the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, uh, Senator from Alabama, who, I, who was too racist to be confirmed as a federal district court judge in the 1980s, and yet here we have him 30 years later, and he's going to be the Attorney General. And maybe. Uh, uh, uh. Um, well, maybe, except he's a senator, and senators in the United States have a long-standing tradition of camaraderie and fellowship and everything, even for people on the other side. Mm -hmm. So it's very unusual for someone coming out of the Senate who gets picked for uh, some sort of uh, uh, position that needs uh, Senate approval. It's very rare for them not to get approved. No it's, doubt. You know, that collegiality of the U.S. Senate. But on the flip side of that, I was a little concerned about his uh, Department of Homeland Security pick, General Kelly, mm -hmm. because he was a, a SOCOM drug warrior for, you know, he w involved in the Colombian interdictions and things like that, you know, a very, very hardline anti-drug guy. Mm -hmm. But he came out the other day and he's just like, look, you know, I got no problems with medical marijuana. You know what I mean? He's just medicine like, is medicine, yeah. yeah, and he's just like, look, he's like, don't worry about me with all that. And, you know, he, apparently he, he, he claims to wield a, d a decent amount of influence as Department of Homeland Security chief for incoming and has no problem with it, but avoided the recreational question pretty mm -hmm. as as much as he could. He didn't want to touch that. Well, as, so. he, as, he, saw, as he told uh, some South American um, uh, military leaders uh, in, in remarks that had been publicized, um, you know, don't worry about these legalization attempts because the federal law is that it's illegal and the law is the law. And so now he's being, he's put into a position where he can um, uh, actually affect that policy. Um, uh, and this this piece comes out of the the RJ where where they're saying will these industry expansion plans be slowed by Trump's AG and uh, um, the Armin uh, Yemen wow where do we get some of these names that that, that I have to come up with uh, 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 on every show anyway Armin one of the founders and co-owners of Essence Cannabis Dispensary here in Vegas says no one is calm about this issue the industry is definitely not happy with the appointment and we're very nervous about what he could potentially do and indeed what he can do uh, as the nation's top cop uh, is to undo all the legalization strides that have been made uh, in the past eight years in in what is now a 6.7 billion dollar cannabis industry uh, here in in the US and he can undo a lot of this with nothing more than a pen and his signature I read an article the other day from the marijuana majority people mm -hmm. that said that a group of 20 legalization uh, activists and lobbyists made their way into his office on mm -hmm. Capitol Hill to give him a talk. And uh, during the meeting, he wasn't there. It was like his chief of staff and a couple other of his aides and things like that. And they're sitting talking. And in the back of the room, one of the activists decided to roll a joint right there in the, because you know, it's decriminalized in D.C. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and he didn't even think anything of it. And he tried to pass it to the... Uh, to the aid and you know it's like that's <laughs> like that that's funny to us but, but i bet that fucking pissed him right pop. off yeah and it's just like that's not in my opinion i don't think that's how you build bridges is by kind of literally shoving it in the guy's face no. you know like i i, I, I agree it, it, it made news or whatever i guess but uh if you're really trying to convince this guy and you want to be taken seriously for christ's sake pretend to be serious for five minutes yeah so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I had that happen here in Nevada. One time I was at the, uh, the Grant Sawyer building, and we were testifying before a Nevada Senate Judiciary Committee uh, several years back. And uh, we were up there, you know, in a suit and tie. I mean, that's just how I address the legislature and this and that. And, and we had a couple other people uh, addressing who were professionally dressed. And we had this one guy uh, just show up out of the blue. Uh, he, he was wearing, you know, one of those uh, wife beater uh, yeah. T-shirts and, and, you know, just looked like he had come out of the desert and he came up there and said, oh, I'm going to testify. You know, I want to testify about this. And, and we were like, well, okay let us go first let us do our thing and then watch what we're doing oh yeah okay but i want to testify in this and that and um so we we got through our remarks he went up there and you know 
when when you're dealing with people in a in a professional capacity, you treat them professionally. And um, Valerie Weiner was the senator in charge of the judiciary at that point. And he just gets up there and he's like, "Well, I'll tell you, Valerie, you got to change this law because we don't like it like this." And I'll tell you, all the people are smoking down here in Las Vegas. And, and you know, it's exactly what you're saying. Everything that this guy said guaranteed set these people on fire and just oh every all you know you made your arguments undid, constructively and professionally did. and yeah it, none of that was heard no nope. um, no nope. and so you know it's, it's the same thing here with what you're saying the the takeaway there was not that you had a bunch of uh, reformers coming in and having a serious discussion with sessions chief of staff all they remember is the guy rolling the joint and being an asshole joint. yeah Exactly that. So, you know, and, and this is so very important because in 2013, it was um, the signing of the Cole memo by the uh, by then uh, um, AG uh, Eric Holder, who which which actually allowed for these uh, these dispensaries and other MMEs to really begin to flourish and come out of the shadows to some degree by laying out eight points where the federal government had an interest but otherwise they were going to de-emphasize it. You know, things like uh, to kids or, or diversion or, or illicit trafficking to, to other states where they did not have medical marijuana, that, that sort of thing. But uh, all that can be undone because it was just a memo. It was not passed by Congress. It was not an executive order or anything like that. It was just an, an opinion by by the Attorney General, which then got carried down to the the three the 93 uh, U.S. attorneys uh, around the country for what was going to be federal enforcement. So uh, uh, Jeff Sessions, if he does come in as a AG, in in overnight he can change that whole thing. And currently the um, uh, the marijuana industry in the US is I think I read recently uh, 6 point seven billion dollars expected to go uh, over 20 billion dollars uh, before 2020 and and could go significantly higher than that this one guy could just stop all that and so um, you know you're right he's gonna have to be confirmed by the Senate but it's a question of uh, is there anything that, that we can do to prevent that or stop no, the, that because the nuclear no I would say probably not they could force through anyone they want at this point if they really wanted to well this we'll guy see. this guy is a big problem because you know he has been a prohibitionist for decades and and he said uh, in April he said we need grown-ups in charge in Washington to say that marijuana is not the kind of thing that ought to be legalized it ought not to be minimized that it's in fact a very real danger I mean, come on. Uh, I, I, rhetoric they, like that is more dangerous than exactly, cannabis. Exactly, exactly. You, you know, know, rhetoric like that gets people gets people's doors kicked in and murdered trying to flush a bag of pot down their toilet. Yep. You know, rhetoric like that gets people's dogs killed. Rhetoric like that gets people's assets seized and, and that they ruins legally their made. their entire lives, no doubt about it. Uh, well, Derek Peterson, who's CEO of Terratech, who has several licenses here in the state of Nevada, said that Sessions' views are archaic at best your stock is garbage Derek you know and he says I fear <laughs> he th I think the fear is a little bit irrational well we'll be we'll be seeing if it's irrational if, if next year the uh, the SEC starts cracking down on companies like Terratech which are publicly traded uh, and are yet yes uh, yes you they know, are a federally <laughs> illegal uh, uh, enterprise so it, it's interesting to see where where it goes but you know if 60 percent of the country believes that this should be legal I would hope that a person wouldn't put his own personal beliefs ahead of what his constituents would like so says hey, the, hey, ho, the, whoa, the, whoa, the whoa. co-owner of essence you just said his <laughs> constituents yeah. so you're talking about his He's constituents no he as uh, let's He's just talk about him as a senator sure okay so as a constituent he's from Alabama mm -hmm. not exactly the, cons exactly the, the a supportive for, constituency yeah. no so he can go ahead and play to his constituency as the owner said yeah 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 well, well said friend yeah <laughs> that's crazy okay so let's get rid of that all right but at the it, and but let's stick with that for a moment uh, in in the the trump administration and that um there's he revealed on Thursday that he's selected a fellow named Scott Pruitt, who's the current Oklahoma State Attorney General. Wonderful. To run the Isn't that one of the guys that was suing? Uh, 
Is that one of the guys that was suing, suing Colorado? Colorado. Oh, yes. Fantastic. Ab absolutely. Uh, you may recall that uh, that last year, uh, several states, including Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, sued the state of Colorado in the Supreme Court because that is the proper jurisdiction when states sue each other um, uh, to to stop. Uh, Colorado's legalization, they said, because the uh, the pot that was being grown and sold uh, and consumed in, in Colorado was making its way across the borders. I guess the wind was blowing and the smoke was was wafting over to Kansas or something like that. But they uh, uh, these attorney generals from these states said that uh, that Colorado's behavior was affecting them, and so the Supreme Court had to shut them down. The Supreme Court would not hear the case, essentially uh, uh, ending their argument. Oh, good for them it. for that. You know, if, if they want to enforce their archaic drug laws, they can do so, but they can't force another state to change just to suit them. But anyway, as, as you point out, um, this fellow, Scott Pruitt, was part of that action. Um, you know, and, and what gets me with these guys is the um, the hypocrisy of them? Oh, absolutely! It's you know? always been my my beef as a as a young Republican, or what I was raised to believe mm -hmm. is a Republican is champion individual liberty and you know keep keeps, keeps government out of my business and things like that. But uh, personal you know, responsibility th that that doesn't you know sure well none of that really apply that applies when they're talking about gun gun policy and and other policy, but they're not all about that when it comes to cannabis. I mean, it's funny how. Uh, it's funny how certain people within the United States government will uh, <laughs> they'll trust a 16-year-old to drive a 4,000-pound vehicle mm -hmm. at you know 100 miles an hour, however fast a vehicle can go, or send an 18-year-old to you know Fine drive a tank to yeah. drive a tank. But when they come back, you know, uh, we can't trust you with marijuana. That's way more dangerous than the war we just sent you to fight. Yeah. You know, and I could, yeah. you know, or the driver's license thing, you know, you give a 16 year old, you know, a car, but pot's too dangerous for a 21 year old, you know, and, and we could just go about it all the time. But the long, long and the short of it is that, you know, Republicans champion individual liberty when it suits their political agenda, just like every other, you know, political party in this country, which is why the two party system sucks. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of and Oklahoma. Yet, and yet, you know, though, though, having more than a two party vote uh, uh, in this election may have thrown it to. Um, uh, to Donald Trump, be, they, you know. that's that's always been the argument, though. That was the argument when, in uh, 2000 with Gore. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Ralph Nader is so much more than the guy who supposedly blew the election for Gore. Absolutely. You know, he was the leader of all these organizations, and he he, mm -hmm. he was the guy who was responsible for seatbelts, I think. And yep. you know, there's all kinds of stuff, but he will always be vilified as that guy. I mean, George Bush Sr. still won't talk about Ross Perot to this mm -hmm. day. He won't mention his because he knows for a fact that he cost him the election Perot with Clinton and Bush things like election. that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it just is what it is. And I, and I really uh, dislike the narrative that these people just play spoiler. Uh, these people are, think that they're honestly best for the job. They invest their whole lives into these campaigns to try to make this country a better place. Perot, Gary Johnson, all mm -hmm. these people who try to go third party. And if the pollsters and the actual people who run the debates in my opinion would give them a damn fair shake and include all these people from the get you'd have a much more diversified opinion of where this country really sits open primaries and things like that but that's a whole nother can of worms you might actually get to seven percent or even crack double digits at some you never, point you, never but, know. you know unfortunately we do have the system that we're in yeah you know and what we have is a federalist system where where power rests in washington but is is mostly uh, granted to the states yet you're subservient to that federal system and you know this is this has been a big point that between republicans and democrats for many years mm -hmm. in that the republicans are are, are um, anti-federalist and they say that the power should reside in the states and that that uh, small limited government uh, uh, in the states is the best way to enact most of the policy I, in this I wish that were true <laughs> well I mean that, that's the theory but it, it's not you know but they say it when it suits them uh, this fellow Scott Pruitt is, is a According to this article uh, in Slate.com by Mark Joseph Stern, he's one of the phoniest federalists in the GOP. Uh, what he does is he, he backs uh, expansive federal power when it suits him. Uh, at the same time, Pruitt uh, supported the state's ability to regulate pollution within their own borders and keep the federal government from reg regulating it for them. He argued that states have no right to legalize marijuana. His rationale uh, for this contradiction is that pollution isn't especially harmful to other people but marijuana is 
Right, and, and right. So you, can, so you can't regulate pollution, but you can stop that joint, you know, and, and it's just the, this kind of um, hypocritical faux arguments uh, 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 that, that people make just to twist things for when it suits them. Sure. It's just... I'm not surprised that Trump picked someone from <clears throat> Oklahoma for his cabinet. I was looking at the electoral college map recently about you know mm -hmm. the county by county breakdown of the popular vote, like who won what counties and things. Mm -hmm. Every single county in Oklahoma went for Donald Trump, without one. They, I think they're the only, the only state in the country where every single county went. So wow. I think he might be showing some loyalty back to that. Well, you know what what this get, where this brings me uh, at this moment uh, is. Um, here we are on the 13th, uh, which is today, today is an inflection point in history, right? You have all these things that, you know, go day to day to day and our life goes on. And all of a sudden we're 50 years old when we, yesterday we were 25. <coughs> and you have, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to have to, <coughs> I'm going to have to just take a quick drink here. <coughs> Pulling a Marco Rubio. No kidding. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm I'm sorry about that. Um, where where was I going with this thing? Um, we have an inflection point today because most of the days we, life just goes on and on and on and on. Slow news days, right? They call them. But here we are today in America, where we have our electoral college meeting today, and they're going to cast their votes on the 19th. But they're meeting today to determine the future of this country, and. <clears throat> The purpose of the Electoral College is to prevent an unqualified person who is just, you know, spirited in on, a, on the wings of populism but has no business running the country. The Electoral College was meant to prevent those persons from actually assuming power. So here we are at one of those points where, where we have these people meeting and they, these electors have our future in their hands and they can determine of good conscience and good faith that Donald Trump is not qualified to be president and they can vote for whoever they want. They could vote for John Kasich, they could vote for Jeb Bush, they could vote for anybody else. Well, you, you know, know, I could say the same thing about Obama, but I would have been deemed racist. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you can't say that. Except he Obama had, he didn't had no lose business. the popular vote by almost 3 million well, votes. Uh, let's talk about the popular vote. They had agreed to the rules before the election mm -hmm. had gone down. Donald Trump wasn't campaigning for the popular vote. And the reason why Hillary won by almost 3 million popular votes is because of her more than 4 million point vote swing in, ca in California. Mm -hmm. This is why the Electoral College exists, so that one state doesn't determine policy for the other 49. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what happens in the heavily, heavily liberal areas, which is why you know the balance of power has to be put that way. Now, if we had been doing a, a popular vote, then he would have campaigned in places like New York and and, and Florida California. and California yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, I'm not for the elect, I'm for the electoral college uh, putting in place the 45th president of the United States as was voted on by a disproportionate, a, a, a landslide, overwhelming electoral college victory by, by Ooh. Donald Trump of over 300 electoral votes that he won. And it's just one of those things. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. You know, it's the sour grapes from the left. You know, what you got, what the left should do is not be pointing the fingers and begging for the electoral college to, to hold their diaper pins and fix this. But what they should do is free focus on their mm -hmm. own losses and try to look inner and say, how did we lose this? And what can we do to get back to the dominant status that we had just a few short years ago? The, the Republicans now control the Supreme Court because of the slow dragging that McConnell did. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the, SCOTA, the Supreme Court, the presidency, the House, the Senate, mm -hmm. and they have- They control and the government. They have an, not only that, but on an individual level, over 60% of Americans have chosen a full Republican representation. Mm -hmm. Governor, House, right. Senate. Right. And all, you know, so when the Democrats start looking at that and they're just still pointing, oh, you're a racist or you're a Messiah, none of those things work. This is what got them into trouble is pointing the, playing the damn blame game. And you want to talk about what's fair? Mm -hmm. What about Bernie? Where were you guys bitching so much when Bernie got fucking screwed mm -hmm. by the DNC? I remember watching Hillary lose states by the popular vote and have all of the delegates go to her, uh, go to her mm -hmm. because of the way the rules were written. Right. The Democrats were the ones who rigged the election for Hillary. Mm -hmm. All of those people were mm -hmm. good soldiers 
Warriors. Now, I congratulate them, I'm mean, not congratulate them, but it's honorable for them to be such good soldiers and play together like that on to behalf of her. For, for Hell yeah, party, sure. that was an unbelievable <laughs> uh, show of unity, I thought. Mm -hmm. And it still, it split them in half more than mm -hmm. if they would have just let the system play out and let them cut each other's throats out and see who really was the best candidate, which was probably Biden and Warren, if you had to make me do the dream. They had covered a lot of bases, mm -hmm. but they didn't do that. They played all these games, and now they're, they're crying sour, and it just is what it is. They need to look inside of their own. They need to do some soul searching I, before I, they start pointing the fingers. I, I would just like to comment, though, that... Um, that the landslide that you talked about uh, that Donald Trump had, the Electoral College landslide. Um, Maybe remember, not a landslide. I remember when uh, Richard Nixon beat George McGovern in 1972, <clears throat> where Nixon won 49 states. When or when Reagan, won, I remember won. when I was working for the Republicans in Reagan won, I used to work for a group called the 525 Group in reference to the 525 yeah. Electoral College votes that he won. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, so I, I wouldn't call what Donald Trump has here a landslide. Uh, in the Electoral College, he won by a, you know, he won the Electoral College by a significant margin. But I, I, I'm leery of um, giving him more legitimacy than he already but has. That's what this is though. All these all these things are like the Hillary campaign manager trying to say, oh, it was the Russians. Like in desperation, they blame the Russians. You know, it's just well, unbelievable. Maybe they're it's, blaming it's, the Russians because it was the Russians. Well, maybe uh, you know, once I think again, they were involved in this. Well, that, once that again, the Americans shouldn't have been so stupid as to. Uh, and they do well. And they do the uh, well. And the Democrats should have been not so stupid as to think that they could have conned the American people into voting for someone mm. that they didn't want to vote for just because she was the damn nominee. I, oh, I, I agree. She was she was not the best candidate, and uh, all know. this is is an effort to delegitimize de the election. Mm -hmm. That's all this is, and it's not going to work. You know, it just is what it is. Like I said, what Democrats need to do is just do what they do best. Do grassroots work and try to convince Americans that their ideas are better than the other side's. Yep. That's it. And with that, we've got to convince you that our sponsors uh, are, are the better places to go so they keep us on the air. So stick with us and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. That's tough. And we're back. And Nevada we're Cannabis back News Hour. So, oh, all right. In our last segment here, we've got a couple more stories we, we'd like to cover. Uh, this one comes uh, from sfgate.com uh, by author uh, Oscar Pasquale. And it says teen marijuana use uh, is declining under legalization, according to federal data. And, <laughs> you know, and this is, this is an important thing, I the think. The forbidden and, fruit theory coming yeah, into play. Exactly that. And, and the article says that pot use among 8th and 10th graders has decreased since 2015, while use among 12th graders has stagnated. 8th grade use is down to 5.4% compared to 6.5% in 2015. That's, that's when I started. That's a 20% drop. That's when I started smoking grasses in 8th grade. In 2015? Eighth, oh. Yeah, yeah, oh, shit. <laughs> I'd probably been better off if I wouldn't have started in 8th grade and waited until 2015, but here we are. Yeah, right? <laughs> the, the, ten, the rate of use in uh, the 10th grade students is at its lowest level in over two decades. Uh, and uh, I don't... Oh, this, this is classic. 
um, Dr. Nora Volkow says, I don't have an explanation. And Dr. Nora Volkow is the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And she said, this is somewhat surprising. We had predicted, based on the changes in legalization, culture in the U.S., as well as decreasing perceptions among teenagers that marijuana was harmful, that accessibility and use would go up but it hasn't gone up i and would have to concur with her i thought that all of our talking points on that was just nonsense the kids were going to jump right on it but no, I, 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 because you know. the kids who want to smoke are already smoking they're, they're not letting you know fear of, of arrest or, or anything like mm -hmm. that stop them and so now that it is no no longer that forbidden fruit oh you know it's just another thing and as you have these states where legalization uh, uh, has resulted in retail outlets those places have multi-million dollar licenses to protect right and uh, in Washington they went in recently and uh, went undercover and tried to buy uh, pot with um, uh, you know using an underage buyer and they did not find a single place that, that would well, sell it to them they take it seriously like here in Vegas I've covered it before if you're an alcohol retailer and you get caught selling to an underage person mm -hmm. you get a slap on the wrist and then the second time you'll get a fine and then mm -hmm. the third time you'll get a fine you know it's it's worth it for them if you look at like the risk versus the reward mm -hmm. sometimes it's worth it to sell it to the kids because they're like fuck it we're making some you know mm -hmm. like if we get caught We'll just pay the fine and go, you know, to help. Which is it. different here in the, in the marijuana. No, they'll industry. they will. They're, they're oh my god, I, I can't. Ima I can't imagine what would defense. happen if someone was to was to get caught selling selling pot to an underage. It'd be on the news for sure. I will certainly. You know, but but what what strikes me here is that you've got the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, who has been an ardent drug warrior for for years now. Uh, I've I've familiar with this person and she's just totally blown away that uh, that kids might decide well just because it's legal doesn't mean I have to go smoke my brains out that's you know? great I'm happy that she didn't try to give some ridiculous explanation and just said it very bluntly and scientifically look we don't understand it and that's okay that you don't understand so so if if you know the government and all the prohibition is worried that that marijuana use is going to skyrocket if we uh, if we have legalization and all oh, the kids and this and that well it's not the kids so if it's not the kids that are that are smoking it uh, who is we wonder well interestingly oh yeah okay yeah we see it's you over there John um, <laughs> but uh, recently uh, and this also comes out of SF gate uh, a study conducted by New York University's Langone Medical Center has found a massive increase in the rate of pot use over the age of 50 since 2000 Six and researchers evaluated data from forty-seven thousand one hundred and forty adults. So that's a that's, that's a, a good, large sample that's a size. Large sample size, uh, aged fifty or older that's in the U.S. Uh, through a secondary analysis of the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Oh, the, from twenty from two thousand six to twenty thirteen. And and you know I always have to wonder about the numbers from these because these are a survey where you're sitting at home, you're munching on your Cheetos, you're vegging out on the TV, you're smoking another dupe, and the and the phone rings and it's and somebody says, I'm from the federal government, and we're doing a survey on illegal drug use. By any chance, have you been using heroin, cocaine, oxycodone, marijuana, PCP, You're MDMA, like, uh, or anything no. like that in the last month, in the last year? And, and how many people are going to say it? But enough people say, fuck it, I don't care. You know, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and admit to this, that, that they still have a huge amount of people saying yeah. You know, I think the, the numbers of use are even higher than those who, who will admit. But the authors <laughs> found a 71% increase in marijuana use among adults the age of 50 and over throughout the same time period of 2006 to 2013. Uh, adults age 65 and older use pot significantly less, although their prevalence of use actually increased nearly three times as much over the span of eight years. Wow. So you've got 50, 50 pluses smoking a lot more, and you've got, you've got the senior citizens smoking more. But well, in, in if you're an analyst or a marketing numbers, director, you're yeah. looking at uh, changing your marketing strategy potentially. <laughs> yep. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting to see where everybody, oh, the kids, the kids, the kids. No. Oh, my God, the seniors. You know, Grandpa's going to forget where he put his Fritos. My God, this is terrible. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Grandpa might have uh, a little bit more disposable income yep. than the kids. You might uh, want to think about advertising to them instead. There's absolutely that. And so, you know, we... 
we're, we always have too much news. We just got a couple of minutes left, but we we got to touch on this piece, Perry, oh, because sure. we we held this over from last week. But it's really important and demonstrates what we're talking about. Well, the report. This is coming. This is from uh, Derek, Derek Stanley, Stanley over at Hemp News. Yeah. The report says that beer volumes have been declining in markets where recreational marijuana is legal. Um, I didn't think it would have such an immediate effect on the beer sales, but the alcohol industry is already taking notice and putting mm -hmm. out kind of not warnings, but like uh, whispers like, hey, you know, watch out for this. That's why the beer truck drivers and the wholesalers fought against this in California in 2014. Well, yeah. That's why we got them well, well, on board in Nevada in, for, for IP2. And here we are in three markets that they're targeting on this uh, study. It's Washington, Colorado, and Oregon, which are, of course, recreationally cannabis legal, but also craft beer is very popular mm -hmm. in these three states. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a beer drinker, you know. Uh, so let, let's just go over it real quick. Economy beer sales are down 2.4%, 2.4% year over year, and premium domestic volumes like Bud Light, Coors Light, etc., they're down 4.4%. Craft beer growth, growth has slowed in the three markets, but uh, Oregon and Washington are kind of still seeing a little bit of growth in the craft beer area, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. major beer, but like it, the traditional beer down. sales are so, slowing. So yeah. what's happening is you're allowing people to have another choice right. of, of recreational substance. And the fact that you have something that is is less harmful uh, overall is taking people and saying, well, you know, I don't need to buy a case of beer for the weekend. Maybe I can just do with a six pack. Stop by the dispensary instead, yeah. I'll stop by the dispensary instead. We'll see how it rolls. Uh, we'll see how these numbers play out as the years go by. <laughs> Indeed. So we hope that uh, all of you will be out there and stop by your local dispensary and support our sponsors. They help us uh, bring this show to you every week and give you the latest news. And, and with that, we're going to sign off for today. Uh, another episode concluded. We'll see you back here next week with the latest news in cannabis from Nevada and beyond. Thanks for joining right. us.